Hello and welcome to our program. A mystic and spiritual master once said, Well, we invite you today to join us and this very mystic as he takes us on a journey to express and explore life, love and laughter. Please welcome Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev. <laughs> Sadhguru, welcome to the program. <laughs> Sadhguru, when we talk of celebration and every moment being a celebration, life being a celebration, there are different kinds of celebrations. There are also collective celebrations. We uh, celebrate Janamashtami, we celebrate <laughs> uh, Mahashivaratri. What is the role of celebrations? So people think celebration is an effort to be joyful today. They are throwing parties every weekend. Parties used to be only for the names that you suggested, Mahashivaratri, Janmashtami, this, that. But at one time, there were 365 festivals in this country in a year. For everything, there was a celebration. That celebration was an expression of our joy. Okay. Today, people are going to party. If you don't give them the drink and the drug, they cannot be joyful. They are trying to be joyful. Mm. There's a big difference between trying to be joyful and expressing your natural joy. Celebration is... is an active expression of your joy. I may be joyful, but now five of us, five joyful people got together. Then it's an explosion of this. Okay. But right now, ten people are getting together and trying to be joyful. And to be peaceful, you need a chemical. To be joyful, you need a chemical. To be loving, you need a chemical. For everything, you need a chemical. So you are desperately trying to be joyful. This will take a huge toll on humanity as time goes by, you will see. By step from so outside. True. <laughs> so true. See, look at me, I'm always drunk. <laughs> on joy, <laughs> on gratitude. On just life. life. On life. <laughs> Very beautiful. <laughs> Nama Shiva Om Nama Shiva Anadi kaal se manav samudaye satya ki khoj karta raha hai Phir chahe wo kisi vastu vishesh ki jankari praapt karne ki ichcha ho Ya jeevan ke bunyadi tattwo ke rahasyo ko janna Jeevan ke aadhar ko samajna Or apne astitwa ki seema ko एक तरह से लांघने की प्रक्रिया ही आध्यात्म है सदगुरु वेन वी टॉक ऑफ रिलीजन यू नो सर्टन डेट इज फ्लैश इन फ्रंट सर्टन कलर्स फ्लैश सर्टन सिंबलिज्म फ्लैश इज इन फ्रंट इज रिलीजन अ गेट वे टू समथिंग मच मोर See, uh, as a culture, Bharat as a culture is irreligious. There has never been a religion in this land because I'm going by the technical definition of what is a religion today. Okay. Religion means you must believe something, absolutes, that this, this, this and you must believe. If you don't believe this, you cannot belong to this religion. This is not a land like that. In the same house, five people worship five different gods and they have no issues. Because there never has been that there is a belief system. The significance of this land is, we have always been a land of seekers. Our goal has never been God. Now, this is dangerous stuff on national mm -hmm. television. Mm -hmm. I want you to listen carefully, every one of you, <laughs> because... Okay. There has never been the God up there managing our lives. We always told you forever, your life is your karma. That means your life is your making. All the people that you worship, 
are people who walk this land, who walk this geography at some time or the other. Where it is, whether it is Shiva or Rama or Krishna, these are all people who walk this land. They went through the trials and tribulations of life as all of us may go through in so many different ways. There's... none of them were spared from anything. Okay. Lot of drama in their life, yes. isn't it? Yes, true. Only thing is, they stayed above it. Doesn't matter what kind of drama happened in their life, worst thing happened in their life, but they stayed about it. Even in a battlefield, they remained calm and joyful, did what they have to do to the extent it has to be done. So we bow down to them for that quality, that no matter what life did to them, they did not allow life to influence them. They influenced life to whichever extent possible in those times and moved on. So for this one quality, that they lived their lives utterly consciously, not in re compulsive reaction, but in conscious action, not withdrawn from life, conscious action every moment of their life, doing the best they can do without ever life touching them. So for that quality we are bowing them, bowing to them. We must understand this and we must understand this has always been the greatest value in this country because this is not a nation, this is not a culture where we want to go to heaven and sit on God's lap. We want mukti, we want moksha. This means we value freedom and liberation above heaven and God. We want to be even free from heaven because we know after three days we will also get bored in heaven. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> okay, right. So, this is a, a religious country, but it's a spiritual nation. We must understand the fundamental difference. Religion means you're referred to as a believer. The moment you say, I'm spiritual, you refer to yourself as a seeker. You... you can become a seeker, you can become a genuine seeker, only if you realize, I do not know. If you think you know, how can you seek? So true. So, essentially religion means you believe something that you do not know and think that's perfect. Okay. So, all those who believe the same thing will gather together. Spiritual process means you realize that you don't know a thing about the nature of this life, so you become a seeker. If you become a seeker, the most important aspect of being a seeker is, you have an active dynamic intelligence constantly looking at everything with attention. Doors will open for you. The universe opens its doors because of the intensity of your attention and involvement with everything. Because if you're seeking, you look at everything, absolutely. You believe, right now I believe you're no good. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, mm -hmm. okay? Now I will not look at you because I believe this. Or I think you're too wonderful. Mm -hmm. Then also I won't look at you. My imagination plays both the positive and negative things. The moment you believe in some way, you take away the dynamic active intelligence of human nature. The intelligence is not on in every cell in your body. Maybe you're thinking, but it is not on in every cell in the body. When I say every cell in the body, if you touch this, you know what this is just by touching. You don't have to think, isn't it? Right. So there is an intelligence. When we say intelligence, unfortunately today the Western interp interpretation of intelligence is just intellect. They think only thought is intelligence. It took them hundreds of years to recognize emotion is also intelligence. I am telling you even sensation is intelligence, isn't it? And there are many other dimensions of intelligence within you. Right now just using one dimension of intelligence, because we can't figure so many things in our life, we take to belief. Why can't human beings come to this much of sincerity? Mm -hmm. What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. What is the problem? I do not know is a tremendous possibility. Absolutely. Only if I see I do not know, the longing to know, the possibility of knowing and knowing becomes a reality. Otherwise, everything that you do not know, you believe. If I don't believe the same thing, have me dead because I'm uncomfortable for you. If one knows how to manage one's being, why would one want moksha? Because if you can manage it, it's a beautiful world. The challenge, as you said very beautifully, was because we don't know how to manage this, <laughs> that's where the problem is. No, I was only talking about managing the body, mm -hmm. the physiology and the psychology. You don't the manage the being. 
Okay. The being wants to be liberated, <laughs> always. This is not my idea. Okay. See, every human being is always trying to push the boundaries in their life, isn't it? If they try to push it in a basic way, they want to be something more than who they are right now. If they try it in a basic physical way, this is called sexuality. What you're trying to do is, what is not you, you're trying to make it a part of yourself. It may work for a few moments and then it doesn't. Right. If it finds an emotional expression, we call this love. What is not you, you're trying to make it a part of yourself. If you try it mentally, it gets labeled as ambition, conquest, greed or simply shopping. <laughs> okay, okay. So if you find a conscious expression, we call this yoga. Yoga does not mean twisting and turning. Yoga means union, you became one with everything successfully. So then we say you are in yoga. Your practicing yoga is different, yoga okay. bhyas is different. You have become one with everything means you are in yoga. Are you in yoga, are you practicing yoga, two different things. Okay. So a yogi means somebody who's known the union of the existence. So today modern science is going about explaining everything in the universe is the same energy manifesting itself in many different ways. If this is so, why is it that you're not experiencing something? The problem is you're using one dimension of your intelligence which is a cutting instrument. And many lives are in tatters, many people are in tatters, many thoughts are in tatters. They don't need any help struggle. from outside. Right. They're able to do it by themselves. Self-help it's called. <laughs> okay. Right. Ironic, but right. <laughs>
There are many which are only celebratory in nature, which is connected to harvest and other aspects, that's different. But significant festivals have something to do with the planetary positions and the impact that position has upon your physiology. There is every… every month on the fourteenth day is called Shivaratri. One day before the new moon day is called Shivaratri. Okay. So on that day, there's a natural upsurge of energy in the system. Maha Shivaratri is that one day which comes after you move into what is called as Uttarayana or the northern run of the planet in relation to the sun. So, when this Amavasya comes or this Shivaratri comes, the nature of the existence or the nature of the planet is such, especially in the northern hemisphere, there is a huge upsurge of energy. So, on that day or that night especially, we were always advised not to get into horizontal positions. This is why not sleeping, the jagaran okay. is not about going out and playing cards or drinking or meeting your friends, it's not about that. The important thing is your spine should be erect because energies are trying to move this way. In this, if you lie down like this, you will create a distortion in the system. Being conscious of this, they said you must sit up. Sure. How to sit up? People won't sit up, not everybody is so meditative. So celebrations, dance, music, meditation, something to see that everybody is sitting with their spine erect. Okay. So in many ways, it, this Mahashivratri was receding. I think in the last twenty-three years, we brought Mahashivratri back on the platform. People are beginning to understand, not just in India, across the world, millions of people are sitting up on that night, mm. which is great because this is being conscious. See, for me, if I just close my eyes, I will tell you what day of the month it is in terms of the moon. It's not some extrasensory perception, most animals know. Cobras always know. Human beings have the most evolved neurological system. Every human being should know, but unfortunately, we don't know how to handle our cerebral activity, so non-stop Twitter is happening. Okay. Twitter and clutter and yes. mutter and everything, <laughs> everything else, all the noise is coming. All in. the turtles are happening. Yes. So because of that, we don't notice. So if you notice, you would know on Parnami and Amavasya how your physiology behaves, how it affects your psychological process. This is happening. You just need to be little attentive to what's happening. On specific days, it's much more. Mahashivratri is one day when there's a huge upsurge. In the yogic culture, every Shivaratri people stay up, okay? okay. In, in the ashram, for example, in the Isha Yoga Center, right. every Pavnami and uh, Yamavasya, it's like this. On Pavnami nights, the temples are open only for women. Okay. On Amavasya nights, it's open only for men. Okay. Because significantly, masculine and feminine is dominant on those days. 
Okay. So, accordingly, they make use of that space and that energy in a certain way. They are instructed how to make use of it. But Mahashivratri, you don't have to know anything. For anybody, it will work. Mm. So, at least if you don't know anything, at keep, keep your spine erect, that's right. all. Simple. Go to a cinema right. if you want. Simple but so powerful. And it I is. think the whole... Uh, the whole way of putting it across and making it uh, actually... And that's the reason for saying, okay, go to the temple because that's what works. You don't have to keep explaining this whole thing but say, at least the benefits come to you mm -hmm. and that's the mass See, moment. people who... This is an open space, Mahashivaratri, happening in our center. Right. Probably the largest event on that day in the country. This million and odd people who come there, for many people, they have not done any yoga or any meditation, anything. That one night is life transforming for many people. You will hear this from any number of people. Right, we have. Right. Sadhguru, what is the role of thought and thinking in spiritual awakening? <laughs> See, a thought is only a hand post. Maybe this term is not used anymore. A hand post, you mm -hmm. know. In olden times, or even today in some parts in southern India, we have this, that uh, let us say this way to Himachal Pradesh means there will be a... Pointer. A pointer, which is called a hand post because it's in the shape of a hand, like a man pointing. Right. So suppose uh, it is written this way to Kedarnath, it only points, it doesn't take you there. Hand post is not a vehicle to travel with. It's only a direction to take. So if you climb on top of this and sit on this hand post, you are not going to get to Kedarnath. You only have to take the direction. So like this, thought only sets a direction. It doesn't take you there. Now the problem with most people is, they think it actually takes them there. In the sense, right now if they start thinking about something, they are already there in their imagination. So, once you lose this distinction, what is a psychological reality and what is existential reality, you will be eternally confused. True. Psychological reality is entirely made by you. Existential is there. You have to live in what is there. You can't make your own stuff and live in your mind. If you live in your mind, unfortunately, uh, you know, we got this from the Europeans that man is sitting like this thinking. <laughs> the thinker, yeah, right. <laughs> this thinker business is essentially from Europe. In India, we never valued human thought. This must be understood in the right context. Because we saw human consciousness is far bigger than thought. Beautiful. Human thought is like bits and pieces of the existence. Human consciousness can contain the entire cosmos. So we always focused on how to make an individual conscious rather than making him thoughtful because you will never put this jigsaw of this existence piece by piece. It's never going to work. You as a human being, if I take piece by piece of you and put it together, kidney, liver, heart, will you become you? It will never happen. So first of all, there are no pieces. Pieces were made by your mind. Okay. Because you are using, even when we say mind, in India, we have various levels of mind. In the yogic culture, we are looking at mind as four parts. This is called buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means the intellect. Today, unfortunately, because of Western influences, we all think intellect is the only intelligence you have. See, the nature of intellect is like this, it's like a knife. If you ask anybody, would you want your buddhi to be sharp or blunt, what would be the natural answer? Sharp. Sharp. Right. So it's like a knife. What do you use a sharp instrument for? To cut. Right. So if I want to dissect you, I need buddhi, I need intellect. Now I will dissect you and see who you are, mm -hmm. but tell me, Will I ever know you by dissecting you? Hmm? No. Is it possible that I will know you by dissecting you? By dissecting you, I may see the size, size and shape of your heart, 
But what was beating in your heart, I will never know. By inclusion, you may know, but by dissection, you will not know. Dissection is useful only to know the physical nature of the existence. Now we are trying to use intellect to know everything. You want to do everything with a knife. When you do everything with a knife, you will leave the world in tatters. In your own mind, it's all so many bits and pieces, it's driving people crazy. They can't sit at ease even for a moment right. because they have cut the world into pieces in their mind. It is like you want to stitch your clothes, but the only instrument you have is a knife. So you stitch with your knife, your clothes will be in tatters. You need something else to stitch. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> but right. now you're trying to do everything with a cutting instrument, which is intellect. With a cutting instrument, if you do everything, inevitably you will be mincemeat after some time. Right, so true. So when we again talk of, you know, Sadhguru uh, in the mind and thought, so we have a... there's history, there's past, and then there is a future, and knowing that the history is like, you know, something which is dead and gone, the future is a mystery. It's the moment and the nowness and the consciousness is what actually keeps us in the nowness. The human being has the capacity to live in the now, yet for some reason the past and the future dominate. See, uh, I, I wouldn't go into the vocabulary that you're using, the okay. nowness. Okay. See, the entire existence is right now, okay, in this moment. Now, this is not about living in the moment. The moment you make a philosophy, live in the moment, you know, this philosophy is going all over the world. Live in the moment, live in the moment, it started in America, now it's uh, also into urban India, live in the moment. I'm asking you, please live somewhere else and show me, please. Can you? Not possible. Then why… <laughs> why such a teaching? Mm -hmm. Why do you need such a teaching that live in the moment? Because anyway, do whatever you want, you can only be the moment. You cannot be anywhere else. Only thing is, what they're telling you is, do not think about yesterday, do not think about tomorrow, which is what you were referring to in some way. I'm saying, it took millions of years of evolution to get this kind of cerebral capability that I can remember what happened in a thousand years and I can project what I want to do in the next hundred years. So, this much capability to get here, nature had to do enormous amount of work for a few million years to get your cerebral activity to this level. Okay. Now, simply because somebody has not learned how to handle their cere cerebral activity, now they are saying, Destroy this because thinking about the past, thinking about the future is freaking us. Let's destroy this, let's be in the moment. What they're saying is, see, if we remove half their brain, they will be living in the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, well put. But that half brain and the tragedy of the being is, they would also be cluttered with a lot of baggage. What is no, our you propensity? Can remove some more. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Till there's a no brain. <laughs> no, little brain enough to just mm. amble around in your house, eat right. and drink and sleep. Right. You can do that. That may anyway happen to a lot of people in their old age. Right. Okay? But the significance of being human is, I remember the yesterday vividly, my experience of yesterday, and I can imagine tomorrow's yet to be situation vividly and create that. So that's the empowering part that of being. That is a the being. most beautiful part of being human. Okay. Just because the problem is this. You have been given a supercomputer and you did not bother to read the, re, you know, user's manual. Without you reading the user's manual, you try to handle this, it's a mess. And now because it's a mess, people are saying, you must dull the mind. Mm -hmm. Do not remember yesterday, do not think about tomorrow, just do what you're doing today. You will do innocuous, meaningless things. You cannot do anything significant. The power of being human is, we remember not only our experience, we remember the experience of the entire world. Right, yes? absolutely. This is what makes us who we are. Because of this, that we don't have to actually go through what a billion people have gone through, in some way we have made that our experience, because of that we can imagine something that we can create tomorrow 
and human life goes on. Now the problem is, all this is coming because joyless people invent these philosophies. They feel little peaceful when they don't think about yesterday and tomorrow, yes? That's the only problem. So I am talking about a chemistry of blissfulness. You know, all human experience <laughs> is based in your chemistry. What you call as joy, what you call as love, at least for love everybody is using the chemistry business. Okay <laughs> <laughs> But for everything, every human experience, your anxiety, your tension, your depression and your ecstatic moments all have a chemical basis in your system. Now, I can teach you a simple way mm -hmm. where you have a chemistry of blissfulness, no matter what's happening in the world, because after all, it is your physiological and psychological situation that you have to manage. You can't manage the cosmic situation. You only have to manage your physiological and psychological situation. If you manage this well, the world is there always. What you can do in the world and what you cannot do in the world is determined by how well your physiology and your psychology is managed, isn't it? So true, right. So that means if the world is within Satguru, we also talk of the path to spiritual growth or spiritual awakening and there are different names for that. So is spiritual awakening an individual process dependent on the self or does the collective play a role in it? <coughs> collective can create an ambience. So the reason why this culture saw the maximum number of enlightened beings right from ancient times is because the society invested in that direction. Because society invested in direction, naturally right from an early age, people were oriented in that direction. So it produced lots of yield. Mm -hmm. Like for example, anything technology means everybody wants to go to Silicon Valley. You think in that valley technology is growing? There is an ambience where everybody is thinking that and driving towards that. So lot of technology happens there. It is not that people there are specially endowed or that place is geared for technology, nothing like that. They have created an ambience where everybody thinks technology, acts technology. So obviously many things come out of it. Similarly, we invested in inner technologies. How to manage this one to its peak? Because of that, we produce results. Unfortunately, we moved a little bit away. It's time we get back this nation there because as external technologies grow, like you know, robotics is growing big time. Suppose the robots start doing all the work, okay? Next time I come, you have a Durdarshan robot interviewing me, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. <laughs> See, I, I should your, be... your job they'll take, not my job. Okay, I should be careful with my <laughs> facial expressions. They might just keep me. <laughs> so I'm saying when it takes all the physical jobs that we are doing and even reasonably intelligent jobs that we are doing, what are the human beings going to do? they are supposed to be joyful, blissful and do something else yeah. which no mechanical thing can do, isn't it? But are we geared for that? This is what we geared for right from ancient times. If everything is well, then what? Right. You're so right Sadhguru, you know we're really not geared to handle joy <laughs> and there are many people who feel guilty for feeling <laughs> joyous. You know, oh, I can't because, be happy all the time. No, no, that's because uh, most people's joy is only in other people's failures. Mm. Yes, people are enjoying what others don't have. So warped. That is so warped. <laughs> Sadhguru, you also say that uh, action does not produce karma, your reaction does. Volition. Okay. See, action is just a physical thing. The intent and the volition behind it is what produces karma because karma is an internal thing that you're doing. The, your thought, your emotion, your intent produces more karma than physically doing something. Mm -hmm. See, right now I took this glass in my hand, it slipped out and jumped and hit you in the head. Accident. This is one kind of karma of negligence. Okay. Or I took this and threw it at you because I don't like what you're saying to me. This is another kind of karma because the intent is to hurt you. Or I want to take this and bang it on your head, but I don't do it out of my civilization. I'll hold it back, but I did it a million times in my mind. Mm. This is a far deeper karma. 
the impact of it on you is much, much bigger than actually throwing the glass at because you. Because you're still harboring it. Because you will do it a thousand times. In your head, true. If you do it physically, you do it only once. So this is not uh, an endorsement that all of you throw things at everybody. The thing is, you must understand, when you create resentment, when you create anger, when you create jealousy, you are generating poison in your system. You drink poison, but you expect somebody else to die. Life doesn't work like this. You drink poison, you die. This is a very fair world. Right, true. So everybody has this whole bit about, you know, assessing. We assess people, we think, think of people, we judge ourselves, we judge people. And we have this whole bit about morality, moral values, my value system, his value system, universal value system. What is morality? What are morals, moral values? I've been in a bit of a controversy because uh, I said India it doesn't have morality. Of course, they misunderstand this. I said this nation has been run on human consciousness, not on morality, but on humanity. I agree. We always aimed at how to stir up your humanity because that's what you are essentially. You are a human being, you are not a moral being, naturally. If your humanity is on, you do the best things. But if I tell you, you must do good things, you will find devious ways to do the… just the reverse of that. But within the legal system mm. or the moral system of that society, every society, how many people are doing absolutely disastrous things to each other, but within the framework of the law. True. So, morality is an imposed structure. Humanity is intrinsic to you and me. Nobody need to impose humanity on me. I am a human being. Maybe, unfortunately, a lot of people forget that, but essentially you're human. Being human means just this, okay. that between other creatures and us, see, they are born, we are born. They grow up, we grow up. They eat, we eat. They sleep, we sleep. They reproduce, we reproduce. They die, we die. Only thing is, they do it smoothly, we do it with a lot of fuss. Mm -hmm. Yes? But the fundamental difference is, all those simple things that every creature does, we also do. But we can do it consciously. That's the big yeah. difference. So when I said consciousness is the way we have structured this nation, so for this, Every generation had many people who were constantly revving up your consciousness. Somewhere because of this long period of op occupation, we broke that system. So there is nobody to rev up your consciousness and your humanity. So we try to fall back on morality, but that's not in our DNA to take morality from somebody. Because even if those entities that we considered as divine came in front of us, we only ask questions. True. When Shiva spoke, Parvati asked a thousand questions. When Krishna spoke, Arjuna is full of questions. Because we are not used to taking commandments from people. Even divine entities come, we will ask questions because we understand in this country, a human being has to evolve. A human being can't be just fixed with five or ten morals and say, this is what you do. It's never going to work. We saw that constantly we have to strive to evolve and this is your making. This is why we told you it's your karma. How you are is your karma. You are joyful, you are miserable, your karma. This looks cruel when you look at it from outside, but this is the only way. This is the most dynamic way to exist. Only if you understand that your misery is your making, you will transcend it. If I think my misery is because of you, will I ever transcend this? You know, I'll just keep blaming and that, that'll become <laughs> the rut of my life, yes. you know, right. We're going to go in <laughs> Sadhguru for a short break. When we come back, we'll want to understand again from you, is there significance in religion that we miss? So religion was given for a reason. There is a particular significance to that and the celebrations and the festivities that we have. Do we miss it and we start using religion as a tool for fear, favor and manipulation? <laughs>
welcome back we are still living and learning with sadguru jaggi vasudev sadguru children are more tender their consciousness is probably less cluttered what are some things that we need to be careful with with children and start working on their being or allowing their being to grow <laughs> earlier as long as adults don't mess them they're quite fine <laughs> yeah keep I away hands off okay <laughs> mm. no total hands off won't work if parents do hands off somebody else will put their hand mm. see you are not the only influence on your child right. there are all kinds of forces so you can't say total hands off <laughs> i must you know my my girl grew up with me when she was three and a half months old i was driving across the country with her this is the time i'm building the foundation so i'm driving every day my hand on her in the front seat i strap her mm -hmm. just a three and a half month old infant three and a half months old yes okay just my left hand here my right leg down full speed and <laughs> on in the country mm. so every place i go i hand over to some every day i'm in different homes and families they did a wonderful job mm. uh, every one of them but you know adults have this problem when they see a child they want to teach the child something that is not worked in their life <laughs> ah nice <laughs> lovely Yeah. Why I'm saying this? Obviously, it's not worked. <laughs> True. Because between you and your child, who is more joyful? The child. Child. So who should be a consultant for life? <laughs> you have no business to be advising the child because mm. he knows life better than you. You may know a few survival tricks, but you don't know any better as to how to be. Child knows better. Yes. So uh, I saw that people have this urge, and I told everybody, nobody will teach this girl anything. No A B C. No one two three. No Mary had a little lamb. I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or not. Nobody will teach her anything. So because nobody teaches her anything, she's all ears and eyes. Mm. And by the time she's eighteen months, she was speaking three languages fluently, because she's listening. She's got ears. Wow. Uh, like this, and she grew up without any influence like this. So when she was twelve, thirteen, she was disturbed with something that happened in the school, and she came home and. Uh, She said, "You're teaching everybody so many things. You don't teach me anything." I said, "Well, I don't do things unsolicited. Unsolicited. <laughs> Here you come. So this is all you have to know." Okay. Never look up to anybody. Then she looked at me. What about you? Kind of expression. Mm -hmm. I said, "Not even me. Because mm -hmm. if you look up to me, you miss me totally. Ah. If you look at me the way I am, there's immense value to who I am. But if you look up to me, maybe you will want to nail me to the wall." and maybe you will do puja to me but you will miss the entire possibility if you look at me just the way i am i am a different possibility if you look up to me you miss it and never look down on anybody never look up to anybody never look down on anybody this is all the teaching if you do this one thing you will see everything just the way it is when you see everything just the way it is you will navigate through your life effortlessly Wow. <laughs> that's that's powerful indeed and not only for a child holds for each and every one of us and the child in each one of us which we promptly kill as we pretend to grow. No they must grow but unfortunately most of them have not grown they still remain children and lot of people claim as if it's a great thing to be a child. See when you are a child you desperately wanted to grow up isn't it? Right. See suppose you got stuck at the age of 6 both in body and mind. Would you think it's a great thing? No. Generally, I know this is not a good word to use, but it would mean that you're in some way retarded, isn't it? Yes. It's not something that you aspire for, but now that you've grown up and you don't know how to handle your adulthood, no, now you want to be a child. This is not good. It's right. wonderful to be an adult. If you become a conscious, mature adult, it's fabulous to be an adult. Right. <laughs> and I think somewhere uh, Sadhguru this brings to thought that we associate being joyous only with children and not with adults. <laughs> and that's so incorrect. That's the whole thing. Yeah. So you were only joyful when you were a child. Because you messed up, you think that was better. No, this is better. Yes. Being an adult is far better if only you are a conscious being.
if you are a conscious being, you would do the most pleasant things to yourself, at least within you. What the world may do to us, we don't know. What world throws us at us is not our choice. What the world throws at us is not our choice. What we make out of it is one hundred percent our choice. This is what it means when we say it's your karma. That right. means your experience of life is entirely your making. Wonderful. Thank you Thanks, so sir. much Sadhguru <laughs> for making this a truly wonderful journey for all of us. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you. भगवान शिव सर्वत्र है सर्वव्यापी है वो आदि है अनादि है वो अणु है वो समस्त ब्रह्मांड है वो द्वैत है और अद्वैत भी वेद और पुराणों में इनकी अनेक परिभाषाएं और गाथाएं हैं कैलाशवासी जिनकी जटाओं में गंगा विराजमान है त्रिनेत्रधारी योगियों के योगी सदैव ध्यान में मगन यू तो समस्त दिवस और समस्त रातें सब उनकी हैं और उन्हीं को समर्पित हैं परंतु एक विशेष रात्रि भी है जिसे हर रात्रि यानी शिवरात्रि कहा जाता है कहा जाता है कि इस रात्रि को भगवान शिव लीलाओं से भरपूर नृत्य करते हैं ये भी मान्यता है कि इसी दिन भगवान शिव और देवी पार्वती का लगन हुआ था ये भी कहा जाता है कि सागर मंथन के उपरांत इस दिन महादेव ने विषपान किया था और नीलकंठ कहलाए महाशिवरात्रि का महत्व इसी से लगाया जा सकता है कि इस रात्रि को देश भर में आदिदेव महादेव की विशेष पूजा अर्चना होती है समस्त शिव भक्तों के लिए ये सबसे उत्तम अवसर होता है भगवान भोलेनाथ का ध्यान एवं उनकी पूजा अर्चना करने का शिव के मूल मंत्र ओम नमः शिवाय की गूंज चारों ओर सुनाई पड़ती है ओम नमः शिवाय ओम नमः शिवाय ओम नमः शिवाय हम सबके साथ जुड़ने के लिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद लेट्स लिसन टू अ ब्यूटीफुल पीस
इस दो अस्तित्व मेरा और कर दो चूरा चूरा पूर्ण होने दो मुझे और होने दो अब पूरा पूरा भस्म वाली रस्म कर दो Oh